I want to I want to open our hearts and minds to uh, another realm today, another realm of faith that we have been talking about. It's interesting that in the, through the course of this series, there are a couple of things that I have revisited. We've talked about healing a number of times, healing in the atonement. We broke down healing. We came back to it. Did healing. I call it. I almost should have given it a different name because I called the last thing that I taught on healing, healing recap where I'm going to recap and go back over what we talked about. But that it was like it was a standalone message. It was just it was my God, you know. So um, today we, we, we talked about it get a two parter on faith, kingdom faith. And today I want to revisit the question of faith, because what we learned in the previous installments was that everything transpires in the kingdom by faith. And we want to make sure that we are operating in this thing properly. Uh, to remind you of one of the major truths of that previous installment, we learned that you can't just have faith for anything. You can't just have the right kind of faith for anything. You can't have faith for somebody else's spouse. I'm releasing faith for their spouse, right? <laughs> Pastors get that a lot. <laughs> the Lord told me you were my husband. I'm already married, <laughs> right? So, um, but we so we we can't. So the question is, what then can we release faith for? You can't. So the text says in Hebrews 11 that faith now faith is. We recognize the fact that faith is a now thing. It's not a then thing. It's not a later thing. It's not a when thing. It's a now thing. Hope is a when thing. When it happens. W-H-E-N. When. Faith says it has happened. You know why faith says it has happened? Because faith already saw it. Abraham, the Bible says that Abraham, uh, 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 basically, long story short, it says that he saw Christ's day. He saw it. He already saw it. It hadn't even happened in the flesh, but it had already happened. It already transpired. So we find that the faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I talk about the fact that just because something is an indicator doesn't mean it's evidence. We learn that there are many things that are presented in, in court that may be indicators, but they lead to the wrong conclusion. Okay, it's not evidence unless what it's leading to is true. Right. So therefore, if faith is the evidence of things not seen, that means that what it's evidential of must already exist. In other words, it is it ain't faith if it doesn't already exist in the spirit realm. All right. So if I'm not your husband in the spirit realm, you can't release faith for it. All right. Now, in knowing now that the way we release faith is to know what already exists. Let's say, well, how do I know what already exists? The first thing you know is that anything God said exists because whatever he says, he sees. He calleth those, be, those things that be not as though they were. And when he called them, they are. All right? So get into the scriptures and find out, God, what are you saying? Then get into the word and find out what are you saying even for me right now at this point in my life. I'm trying to buy a house. Is that house mine, Lord? Because if you say it, I can release faith for it. If you tell me what's mine, then I can release faith for it because I know that once you say it, it exists even though it's unseen. Right. All right. So that's what we talked about in the previous installment about faith. Now let's turn to Mark 6 and let's build on that understanding of faith. I want to talk about taking our faith higher today, a higher level, a higher realm of faith. <laughs> Mark 6 when you get there say there, there. calling your attention in uh, to verse 45 and I'll be reading from the New American Standard Mark, I'm so excited about this word today y'all I hope y'all really catch this thing Mark 6 beginning at verse 45 <coughs> excuse me from the New American Standard <coughs> excuse me now <laughs> Okay, let's back up. 
Verse 44. You got to see this. And there were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. Pastor, now why in the world would you start there? I'm giving a little context so we recognize the fact now that this was the story of the fishes and the loaves. Right? So there were 5,000 people who ate the loaves. Now let's look down in verse 45. And immediately, somebody say immediately. Immediately. What is the point? Why would you say immediately? Clearly there's a connection between what just happened and what's fixing to happen. Because he says, this didn't happen later. This immediately, all right? Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Bethsaida while he himself was sending the multitude away immediately after the fishes and the loaves. And after bidding them farewell, he departed to the mountain to pray. And when it was evening, when the sun had gone down and it got dark outside, the boat that his disciples were in was in the midst of the sea. See, this is not five minutes later. This is the evening time. So the boat is way out there in the sea. All right. In the midst of the sea. And Jesus was alone where? On the land. More specifically, on the mountain. Now, Jesus up in the mountain alone. Disciples way out in the sea. And it's nighttime. Oh, Jesus. All right. Now, and seeing them, verse 48, and seeing them straining at the oars. Now, how in the world can you see them? It would be hard to see them way out in the sea if I'm way up in the mountain and it's daytime. They didn't have binoculars. So this is nighttime and he sees them straining at the oars, even though they're out in the midst of the sea. So the first thing is, this has really not a lot to do with today's message, but I want to point out the fact from, from other messages, clearly he saw them in the spirit. He didn't see them in the natural because he couldn't see them in the natural. But he was still able to perceive. Isn't it amazing that even when it's dark, God can still see us where we are and what we're going through and what we're experiencing, but he was only able to tap into that because he saw in the spirit. There are some darknesses in your own life and you need to be able to see what's going on. But you can't see it if you're only looking in the natural. God opened our eyes to see what's happening in the dark. Because the enemy, the devils, those demons, those roaches scurry in the darkness. And if I'm going to engage them and get them the hell out of my house, I need to be able to see in the dark. I need to be able to see with my spiritual eyes because it does not appear to me what's happening in my house in the natural. It does not appear to me what they're doing on my job in the natural. I can't see what's going on with these finances in the natural. But God, if you can just open my eyes, I can see what's happening in the dark. Now. It was evening. Uh, uh, seeing them, verse 48, straining at the oars, for the wind was against them at about the fourth watch of the night. So we are not talking about 530. All right. Fourth watch of the night. He came to them. Now, they're in a boat. The only is to one that was available. So how did he come to them? Well, he came to them walking on the sea. And he intended to pass them. Highlight, underline, circle, do something with that. And he intended to pass them. Now here's the thing. Jesus, aren't you walking over here to help? Yes. If you weren't going to help, you could just stay on the land. Go back up in your mountain. <laughs> How are you going to pass? Pass me not. Oh, gentle Savior. Here, yeah, my humble cry. Right? How are you going to come out, make me think you're coming to get me, and you're ready to pass me by? Why? Because Jesus, why, the question becomes, why would you do that, Jesus? The answer is, when you are in the midst of a tumultuous situation, God is expecting you to have the presence of mind enough to ask for help. As long as you are paying too much attention to the wind and too much attention to the water getting in the boat, you are not seeing Jesus walking towards you. And if you don't see him in the midst of the struggle, he'll pass you by. Because
because he only turns aside to those who call on him. The text says that in one place it says that he got out the boat and was going about his way. And a man came and fell down before him and asked him, Jesus, my son, my daughter is, is sick unto death. Come and, and, and heal her. And the Bible said he turned and went with Jairus. That was the, the guy, right? So that means that the, 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 the man in his strife, in his struggle, called out to God, called out to Jesus, and Jesus turned and went to go see about him. If you don't want him to pass you by, then have the presence of mind, even in the midst of what you're going through, to know from whence cometh your help. Yes. All right. Now, when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that he was a ghost because they said, "Ah, surely that ain't Jesus walking on the sea." All right. And they cried out, for they saw him and were frightened. But immediately he spoke with them and said, "Take courage. It is I." Do not be afraid. And watch this. And he got into the boat with them. And the wind stopped. And they were greatly astonished. For they, watch this. Now we know why. Verse 45 starts with and immediately. Why he connected the two. Why were they greatly astonished? Why, why were they? For they had not gained any insight. From the incident of the loaves. But their heart was hardened. In other words, why are you surprised when God does something supernatural when you've already seen him do something supernatural? In fact, the text is so explicit in identifying for us the connection between these two that it shows us we're not talking about three months later and I'm asking you to think back when I look back over my life and I think things over I can truly say no just look back a couple of hours ago right. he just healed your left leg and now the right one breaks and you crazy acting crazy did you forget that he just healed your body so he says that they had forgotten, they had not gained any insight from the incident. How much has God shown us through the course of our Christian experience or even through the course of this series, this year-long series on the kingdom of God? How much has he shown us and we have not gained any insight from it? God is trying to prepare us and build us up, the text say, from glory to glory. But we still have not gained any insight from the lesser glories. We still not have gained any insight from the quote-unquote smaller things that he's done. Such that when we get to a seemingly bigger problem, we react in the flesh because we let the situation speak to us more loudly than what he's already done. Are we together? Now, turn to, if you can, hold your place here in Mark 6. And I want you to turn, uh, well, turn to John quickly. Let me just show you one quick thing here in John. And then we're going to turn over to Matthew. John 20. John, I'm sorry, John 6. Verse 20, he says this. Now, this is the same telling of the same story from a different perspective. OK, if you look up in the earlier parts of the chapter around verse, you know, 14, 13, you see there same incident, fishes and loaves. Now they're on the water. So now notice here in verse 20, it says, Jesus said to them, it is I do not be afraid. Right. We recognize the story. But this other perspective adds another element that we're able to glean from. They were willing, therefore, to receive him into the boat because they realized he wasn't a phantom. Right. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now, understand. They were not near the other side of the shore. They were in the middle of the sea. Right. But immediately when he got in the boat. 
they arrive at land. Once again, he's clarifying when he uses the word immediately because he's trying to get you to understand that something just happened here. What just happened? Well, they went from a place of fright to a place of faith. They had confidence now because the master was with them. What they didn't realize was that the master was with them even when he was not physically present. They could have arrived, they could, see, this is what you call supernatural translocation, or what Star Trek called transportation. They were supernaturally transported, translocated from where they were in the midst of the sea, all the way to the other side in an instant. That could have happened be, before Jesus even got into the boat. If they would have responded according to what they had learned from the fishes and the loaves. But they didn't learn it. And so when they found themselves in this situation, the supernatural could not happen because they had not been building on previous experiences with God in order to strengthen their faith. Does that make sense? Now let's look at Matthew 14. <coughs> Y'all stay with me. If I can stay up till 2 o'clock in the morning, y'all can stay up too. Matthew 14, verse 26. Matthew 14, verse 26. He says, when the disciples saw him, now this is, you know, another example. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were frightened, saying, it is a ghost. <coughs> And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Sounds familiar, right? Now, another perspective. So we're getting more of the story. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is really you, command me, bid me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Well, come on in. With your bad self. Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, but <laughs> seeing the wind. Now, wasn't it windy before he got out the boat? Mm -hmm. Yes. But when he saw Jesus, all he saw was Jesus. When he got out of the boat, he again saw the wind because he found himself in a vulnerable situation. And so he took his eyes off of Jesus and returned himself to the same state he was in when he was still on that boat. All right? He had a, 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 a relapse. So it says, he, seeing the wind, he became afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, watch this. Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? All right. Now, I have a problem. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, Oh, you of little faith. <laughs> Didn't seem so little to me. Let's not forget, the man just walked on water. See, when we read, Oh, you little faith, all we think about is Peter flailing about, crying out for help while he's sinking. We forget, this man just walked on water. So while we chide Peter, when last time you walked on some Kool-Aid? Right. right? He just walked on water. So then the question becomes, see, when we read the word little, we immediately think measure or amount. Right? I want to challenge you with the notion that he was not speaking of an amount or of a measure. Okay? Because Peter had just demonstrated what we might consider 
significant measure of measures of faith in the fact that he just walked on water. So Jesus, when you say little faith, what exactly are you talking about? Let, let, me, let, me, let me prove to you that the amount is not the problem here. All right? Well, Pastor, that's not a good philosophy, but that's not what he said. Well, let me prove to you that that's not, that, that that's not what he's talking about. Luke 17. <clears throat> Luke 17. And I just want you all to know, we are going to turn a bit today, but God bless your fingers and hands. Luke 17, because I'm going to really point this, make this thing plain as we can make it. Luke 17, verse 5. The apostle said to the Lord, we want a greater amount or measure of faith. Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, well, baby, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you could tell this mountain or this mulberry tree be uprooted and planted into the sea and it would obey you. What, what was Jesus saying? Jesus said, the amount of faith ain't the problem. You can have faith like a mustard seed and get results. <laughs> Let's see another one. Matthew 17. Matthew 17. He, they specifically requested a greater amount of faith. And Jesus said, the amount is not your problem. All right. Matt, this is, is going to set you free. I promise you it's going to set you free once we understand what's happening here. Matthew 17, verse 20. Matthew 17, verse 20. And Jesus said to them, because of the, hear that word, little, right? But he must not be talking about amount. Watch this. Because of the littleness of your faith. They said, why can we cast this demon out? Because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed. So clearly he was not speaking of amount when he said littleness of your faith. You shall say to this mountain. First it was a mulberry tree or another passage, said a sycamine tree. Sycamine tree. You shall say to this mountain, move from here to there. And it shall move. And nothing shall be impossible to you with faith as a mustard seed. <laughs> and nothing shall be impossible to you with faith as a mustard seed. <laughs> Say this, the size, the size is, not the is not the problem. God, if the size is not the problem, what's the problem? It, it, is, a, it is a faith issue. Because he told them they had little faith. But if the size, if we're understanding littleness as a matter of size or amount, and Jesus is clearly demonstrating the size is not the issue. Then God, number one, what did you mean by little? And what is the issue? Little, as he uses it here, is not a matter of, we clearly see that, it's not a matter of size. Watch this now. In fact, I can, I can demonstrate this to you better by using Peter's example. Peter is walking on water. He's literally walking on water. Then he sees the wind. And he begins to sink. It's not that he had no faith, but his faith hit a brick wall. The brick wall was his attention to the circumstance. That means that the faith did not endure. It was not an enduring faith. Little is not about amount but longevity. Little is not about amount, but longevity. Now, why is that important? Because if we, if the enemy tricks us into considering the amount of faith, how many of y'all realize we'll never think we have enough? 
we'll always wonder, well, God, is this enough? What is, what is the faith price for that healing? Is it 20 measures or is it 25? Because I only have 17 and a quarter in the bank. Right? So I'm praying that I don't come against a situation that requires more faith than I have. So considering the amount of faith will always cancel our faith because it will always put us in a, in a place of questioning and wonderment and worry. Because we'll never be sure. And faith is the assurance. If we can't be sure, how can we operate in faith? So the enemy has been tricking us with this idea of faith having amounts and of us not having enough to get the job done. You can move a mountain with a little amount of faith. You can uproot the tree with a little amount of faith. Watch this now. Watch this. Watch this. Okay. You can walk on water with a little amount of Oh, somebody said, no, I need a little more than that. A little, little more than that. Right? Right. Now, the question isn't how much do you have. The question is how long will it endure? How long will it endure? Okay, I don't want to get ahead of myself. All right, now, let's go back to Matthew 6. This is where we started. Uh, well, it's not where we started. Uh, we started in Mark. And I actually think that's where I want to go. Yes, let's go back to Mark 6. Beg your pardon. Let me show you this. Now, we understand that the text is explicitly wanting us to see the connection between the previous incident of the fishes and loaves and what just took place on the sea and how they responded to it. All right. The text wanted us to see that because it said immediately after they finished eating, Jesus put them in the boat and sent them on. All right. I, do you understand? I believe that Jesus put them in that boat. What? In fact, put the King James up, if you will, of, 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 of Mark 6, verse 45. Mark 6, verse 45 in the King James. Watch what this is. And straightway. Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship. He didn't just say, hey man, why don't you go and get in the ship? Go on the other side. He forced them. Y'all see that? Why would Jesus immediately force them to get into the boat without him? Seems to me like Jesus said, here's an opportunity to see if you just learned anything. And he did it immediately because he did not want the, the excuse. Well, I forgot. <laughs> right? So he said, here's an opportunity to see if you learn something. Because it's not about, can you regurgitate what I said? Can you quote the scriptures? The question is, can you exercise in this new situation what you just exercised or saw in the old one? Does anybody in here have an old situation that you can reference where God moved? If, if, if you can remember the then, then you have all you need for the now. Nobody else raised their hands, like a, just a few, but, but somebody here has seen God move before. So you don't have to just, just, just be out in the, in, the, in, the, in the ocean worrying and wondering because you've never seen God move. Somebody has a testimony and you realize that you have what you need to hold on to and to come into a new experience of God. Now, so we're in Mark 6. Look at verse, you can go back over to the New American. Look at verse 41. So we're backing up now into the lesson of the fishes and loaves. So, so he said that they hadn't learned anything from that lesson. Well, what exactly were they supposed to learn? Let's, let's look and see. <clears throat> so first of all, in verse 37, he talks, they, they, they say, hey, Jesus told them, hey, get us something to eat. They said, well, we don't have any food. Should we just go buy something? We don't have that kind of money. What, what you want us to do? So then Jesus told them, hey, look, go, 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 go around and see what, what we got to work with. Two fish, five loaves of bread. Okay. 
Jesus told, hey, tell everybody to sit down. We're going to pass this food out to everybody. All right? So we get down to verse 41, everybody sitting down in companies of 50s. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. All right? And he blessed the food. Let's just stop right there. And he blessed the food. Now let's read this in the other account. John 6. John 6. We just saw from John 6 the same story being told. But let's see this other perspective. He took the insufficient provision and he blessed it. John 6 verse 11 says this. Jesus therefore took the loaves and having given thanks having given thanks see we bless food and we ask God to transform the genetic makeup of the food such that it nourishes our bodies God take this five liters of salt I just put on this pizza and let it be nourishing to my body God do a transformative work in the name of Jesus Blessing the food is not about change. No, if you want it to nourish you, then pay attention to what you put in it. That's where that works. The blessing is the giving of thanks. But notice he didn't, by giving thanks, he wasn't blessing God. He was blessing the food. What does that mean? That means that by giving thanks, he caused the blessing of God to now come upon the food. The food was insufficient, but with the blessing of God, little became much. And what was the blessing of God? Giving thanks. He was faced with a situation of insufficiency. And watch this. It, <laughs> if Jesus looked with his natural eyes, now we already know Jesus knows how to look with his spiritual eyes because he saw them in the water at night. If Jesus looked at these two fish and five loaves with his natural eyes, he would not have given thanks. He would have given petition. Alright? Right? Yeah. Isn't that how we respond to situations? Yeah. What, what did Jesus, what did Peter say? Lord, help! Right? So, he responds because he sees with his spiritual eyes, we already have. Everything we need. All right? He says he gave thanks. Now, if the disciples later on would have been in the water with the storm, if they would have just given thanks, <laughs> well, Lord, Jesus, told, the, the master told us to go to the other side. So we thank you that we already received the word about our destiny. We don't even have to worry about what we're seeing with these eyes because we have a word. When I have a word, faith can come because I heard the word. Faith come by hearing the word. When I have a word, now I can release faith and I don't have to worry about what's happening in the meantime. See, Christians are meantime freaker outers. We freak out in the meantime. Now we got a word in the start. Because the Bible said he declared the end of a thing from the beginning. So he already declared you're going to get to the other side before you even launch out. But we forget about what he said once we get out into that ocean. Once we get out into that sea and the circumstances begin to scream and yell and speak. And what do we do? We revert back. To the time before he spoke. We forget what he already did. We forget the lessons we already learned. And we become freaker outers in the meantime. But I thank God for loving us enough to say, I sent them out there to see if they learned anything. They didn't. But I'll still come to their rescue. But I'll still come get them. (laughs) And out of this situation that they could have, if they had just given thanks, arrived safely, instantly. How much stuff are we causing to be prolonged when we could instantly be on the other side if we would just learn how to, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 
Faith is looking, no, excuse me, faith is not looking to what will come, but to what is. Faith is not looking to what will come, but to what is. Watch this now. Hope expects, faith receives. See, if you say by faith I am expecting, you've already missed it. Because faith is a now thing, not a then thing. <laughs> All right? We got the candy called now and later. You can't choose between the two when it comes to faith. Faith is always a now thing. All right? Faith, the hope expects, <clears throat> but faith <clears throat> receives. Now, here's the challenge. How do we distinguish between hope and faith such that we are able to identify what we are walking in in that moment? Because if I'm able to come to the realization that what I'm walking in is not faith, then I'm able to actually shift and move into the realm of faith in order to get what it is that I'm hoping God to do. So how do I how do I be honest with myself? And, and determine whether I'm walking in faith. Jesus gave us the answer. He gave thanks. Now, I used it. Remember when we talked about faith before, I used the example of how it may, it, when, when someone, when you receive something, it is the custom. <laughs> Everybody that do this. But it is the custom <laughs> to say thank you. If I give you money, say thanks. Because uh, truthfully, if you don't, I probably won't give it to you again. Because I need to see some gratitude. You know? I'm going to give you out of my own stash. And I ain't got I'm living this a lot. Right? So when we give to someone, the custom is to say thanks. When you receive something, you, you give thanks. If you have not come to a place of gratitude and the giving of thanks, then that is an indicator to you that what you are walking in is not faith. Because faith receives. And it is the custom to give thanks when you receive faith does not expect to receive such that you will give thanks when or then faith receives in the now, which means that wherever there is faith, there is thanks. Did you hear that? Where nobody's talking to me today. I preach to myself wherever there is faith, there is thanks. All right. So that's how you gauge what it is you're walking in. Turn to Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter, chapter one. Keeping in mind that wherever there is faith, there is thanks. Second Peter chapter one. <clears throat> now, we're fixing up the idea of faith because number one, we realize that there's a difference between faith and hope. We're also realizing that we can't release faith for what God has not actually spoken. If it does not exist in the spirit realm, then it is not ours. We can't just release faith for it. Now, think about this. Well, let me, I'll say that later. Second Peter chapter one. Look at this. Verse two. Verse two. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything, everything has granted, not will grant, but has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Again, grace and peace be multiplied to you. How? Well, seeing that he has, that his divine power has granted to us everything. In other words, if you don't see that he has already granted you everything, not will, not hope. If you don't see that he has already granted you everything, you will not be able to have grace and peace. You will not be able to receive <clears throat> grace and peace because you receive that by knowing you have it. How can you have peace when you don't know you have provision? 
All right. Look over in Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter one. He has already granted us past tense everything pertaining to life and godliness. Ephesians chapter one. And he says here in verse two, grace to you and peace. Once again, we see that there is a, uh, uh, well, in fact, let me finish reading it. Maybe I'll show it to you. Grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He has blessed us. Past tense. It's already done with every blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Now, once again, we see that there is a connection between grace and peace and understanding provision. All right. Grace and peace and understanding provision. Now, look over at uh, chapter two. Still here in Ephesians. Verse 8. Now let's see how grace and peace work. What is this connection between grace, peace, and provision? Chapter 2. Now we're still talking about faith, but we have to, I have to break faith down. I have to go under the hood and show you how the engine is working. All right. Verse uh, 8, chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, right? How are you saved? By the grace of God. Period. You are saved by grace. Now, the text says elsewhere that Jesus died once and for all, right? Over in Hebrews. Do you realize that Jesus died for every human being? Right? His grace is extended to every human being. Here's the question. Is every human being saved? No. Well, then why not? If it's only by grace. But no, it's, it's, it's by grace. But it's through the avenue of faith. The power that did it, was what did it was grace. Now watch this. What accessed it was faith. Isn't it sad to have something that you can't access? <clears throat> what did it was grace. What accessed it was faith. Now, I, 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 if, you, if you have been listening back to some old sermons, you will remember that I have emphasized in a couple of other messages that grace did it, but faith, I use the word, appropriates it. Faith lays hold to what grace has provided. Now, the text says that we have, he's already granted us, all everything that pertains to life and godliness, right? Okay. The other passage we read said that he has provided all every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, right? Every single one, right? All things and every blessing. Say that. All things, all things every, blessing. every blessing. Now, how much is all? All. How much is every? Every. Right? That means now. That the thing that you're asking for was already provided. Because it's included in the all. <laughs> right? It, that means if you're asking for it, you haven't received it. <laughs> you haven't received. That means you clearly don't have faith because faith receives. So we say, well, how, Lord, I'm, I, how, I'm, I'm releasing faith and I'm asking you to do this. God said, I am not doing anything because I already have done it. All you have to do is receive it. We're talking about healing, and I made the statement that you have to stop asking God to do what he commanded you to do. Remember that? We have to also stop asking God to do what he's already done. Because asking him to do what he's already done demonstrates unbelief. Because that means that we don't think he did it. And if we already don't think he did what he already did, why would he do it again when he's already done it? You didn't receive it already. You're not going to receive it then. 
Jesus, Jesus said, you didn't hear Moses. Why would I send somebody else? <laughs> right? Jesus, we, we read it before. Jesus said, if you would receive these earthly things, why would I tell you heavenly things? So why is God going to repeat and do again what you already haven't received? You won't receive it then either. That means faith does not get God to act. I know we think it does. It doesn't. Because God has already acted. God has already given you every blessing and all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, how did he do it? By grace. But we access it by faith. Notice this. It was done by grace. When did grace happen? Calvary. It was done 2,000 years ago. That's when we got to the shift from we'll be healed to we're healed. By his stripes, you, we, we, you know, we are to were. It goes into past tense after Calvary. Because Calvary was when provision was made by grace. That means he provided for me everything before I even had faith to receive it. Faith doesn't get God to act. He acted before you even had faith. <laughs> he put the money. When I say money, I'm using money as an analogy for everything you need. He put the money in your account before you even had faith. Before you even knew he existed. You weren't even around yet. And he had already given you all provision. Understand <coughs> that grace was not just extended to Christians. It was extended to the entire humankind. That means every human being has all provision. It's a sad thing to have all provision and not access it because you don't have faith. It's like having money in the bank sitting there and you're still living in poverty when the money's right there in the bank, but you haven't tapped into it either because you're not a believer, which means you don't know it's there. Or you are a believer, but you don't know how to access it. Isn't it sad to be in a state of need? You have your debit card, but you forgot to pay a number. There's a procedure, see, to access what's mine. But I don't know the PIN number. <laughs> and so I'm sitting here on a gold mine, and I can't get what I need because it's after hours. All right? Faith is how we access what God provided by grace. Now, let's turn again. Romans 4. <coughs> Romans 4. Verse 16. Romans 4 verse 16. Now I'm only going to take time to read the first part of this verse. <clears throat> it says, For this reason, it is by faith that it might be in accordance with grace. There we go. See those two things again. In order that the promise may be certain to all. I'll just stop there. In order that the promise may be certain to all. The promises are given by God's grace, but they are accessed through our faith. You don't have a provision problem. You have an access problem. In fact, let me say this. No longer are you allowed to say that you're broke. Because if I know good and well I put $200,000 in your bank account and I hear you say you're broke, that's going to hurt me. Because I know that I gave you more than enough. All right? It's not a provision problem. Watch this now. It's not a lack problem. You don't lack it. You just don't know how to go get it. You don't know how to lay hold to what is already yours. Chapter 5, verse 2. <clears throat> Having been justified by faith, 
We have peace. There's that word peace again, connected with faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also, <coughs> excuse me, we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice, we celebrate, we give thanks in hope of the glory of God. Faith produces thanksgiving. We have access by faith into this grace. Now, what exists within the grace of God? All provision. Healing, prosperity, peace, everything we need for life and to be like Christ. What is Christ likeness? Living holy. Baby, that's just, that's just a little bit sliver of it. Christ likeness is kingdom likeness. Because Christ lived kingdom. So all the stuff that we're preaching about and divine healing and supernatural manifestation and healing, miracle signs and wonders, they are all existent in Christ. So to be Christ-like or to be godly, to be God-like, which means that you live and operate in the supernatural. All right? Everything that we need to be God-like and to be uh, 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 Christ-like and to live this life, life and godliness, is provided through grace. Okay? Now, <clears throat> if everything that we have is provided through grace, notice that he says here that we have access into this grace in which we stand. To stand on something means to be upheld by it. It means to be supported by it. It means to be lifted up and established by it. We are not standing on what we see. We are standing on the grace of God. And how do we actually come into that grace? How do we get introduced to it? By faith. That's why the text says that the just live by faith. Because faith gives them access to the grace. And grace contains Everything you need. Faith is your access point to everything you need. Now, I want to read this passage. I'm going to take my seat. In James chapter 2. We are familiar with this. I've even taught it. But I must say it again. And I'm going to try to say it as quickly as I can. But I must say this again because I want us to understand uh, in, in previously teaching this, I didn't actually give the, the context to it that I think is really going to help us wrap our minds around the depth of this. If we look in James chapter 2, when we talk about the double-minded man, and I've already taught you how this double-minded man, <coughs> excuse me, how he had a problem receiving from God. It was not a matter of God not doing. It was a matter of the double-minded man not receiving. Remember, remember we were talking about that? The difference between that. Now, I'm going to back up, though, and I'm going to show you the context or the connection between this double-mindedness and faith. All right? Watch this. James 2, beginning at verse, or is it James 1? Let me see. James 1, I beg your pardon. James 1. Beginning in verse 2. Watch what he says. Consider or count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. <laughs> you got to be kidding. Count it all joy when you are all alone in the middle of that boat. <laughs> and the sea begins to buffet you. Why? Because counting it joy is what's going to get you to the other side. Because the joy, the giving of thanks, is what's going to access, is, is what is indicative of your faith. And your faith brings about a manifestation. It brings about a suddenly. It brings about an immediately. And immediately they were on shore. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Knowing that the testing of your what? Faith. Produces what? Endurance. It's not an amount problem. It's an endurance problem. And God allows certain tests and trials to come upon us, not to take us out of here, but to help us learn how to endure. Because he wants our faith to last. Because it's only faith that lasts that gets results. 
count all joy, my brother, when you consider or encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result or work in you that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. How do you lack in nothing by faith enduring? Because through faith you access grace and in grace is everything. You can't have lack when you are standing on everything. You are standing on grace through faith. Grace is everything. <laughs> if you are standing on everything, lack literally does not exist in your world. Alright? Let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing by God's grace. But now if any of you lacks wisdom, if any of you doesn't know how to operate in this thing, let him ask of God who gives to all people generously. God is not going to hold against you what you did. Why does he not upbraid it not? Why does he not reproach? Because it's given by grace. It's not given by works. You have to earn it. It's a free gift from God. So whatever you need, you can ask. Now watch, now watch what he says here. Give it to all people generously without reproach and it will be given him. Now we're not talking about provision because that's already been made by grace. We're talking about access. Now look what he says. But if you're going to ask, ask in faith. Well, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me change this. Ask with enduring faith. It's not an amount problem. It's an endurance problem. Watch this now. Without any doubting. For the one who doubts, the one who gets his eyes off of Christ and begins to look at the circumstances more than at the promise. The one who looks at the circumstances more than at the promise is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. What is he saying? You're unstable. The circumstances of life will have you all over the place. How many Christians are schizophrenic because we are all over the place because we are being moved and dictated by circumstance. I'm, I, I can't even lift my hands because I don't even know if the Lord going to come through. You're unstable because you lifted them last week. Somebody's faith is not enduring. If you allow the circumstance to actually shift what you do, then God is saying that you're unstable because faith endures. It does not stop the circumstance. It endures through circumstance. So he says, let not that person expect that he see now it makes us. It was good news when I taught it before, but now we get more context. For let not that person, what person? The one who doubts. Believe that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now, if you look at verse 7 again, let not that person who has the audacity to ask, but not believe. What he says, uh, let not that person expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Now, you just said, said Pastor, that the Lord, I mentioned this before, that the Lord gave to all people. Wouldn't that include the double-minded? How much is all? All. <laughs> right? So it includes double-minded. So then why would this man who's double-minded not receive, expect to receive from the Lord if the Lord supposedly gives to all people? Because it's not a giving issue. It's a receiving issue. He didn't say let that man not expect that God won't give it. He said let that man not expect to receive it. Why? Because, watch this, faith receives. <laughs> if you're not operating in faith, you can't receive even though God gave. God gave to all. That includes you. Doesn't even matter what the situation is. Doesn't even matter how much you've done that was so undeserving and unworthy. He gave to all. Now what's the matter of can you receive it? The ball is not in his court. Heaven doesn't need to move. <laughs> How much are we praying? Watch this. And fasting. Trying to get heaven to move. Heaven is done. Jesus said, boy, it's been a long trek, but it is finished. <laughs> and I ain't lifting nan of the finger. <laughs> the ball is not in our court. He has already given everything we need. To be successful and victorious and prosperous and healthy. That's right. That's 
Now it's a question of receiving. And how do I receive? By faith. Watch this now. That endures. I can't just have Sunday morning faith because Sunday morning faith makes me feel like I can attack the devil any time of day, any time of week. Satan, I'm ready for you and I challenge you now to a duel because I have, I believe that God is my help. Come on, devil. Come Tuesday morning. <laughs> See, the devil is going to stick around past Sunday because <laughs> the devil, the devil will knock on your door. Hey. Right? It's about receiving. Now, why does this? Why should this really set you free? Because when you realize that faith is not a matter of amount, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have enough. How much do we live in fear that God? I'm just not there yet. There is no there there. There is none. It, you can have faith that's microscopic, and it can still move mountains. The question is, do you still have it? Because <laughs> when we all get together, we feel so strong oh, yeah. and so ready. Oh, but when we're isolated, back to our various lives and situations. Oh, <sighs> when Jesus is on the mountain, but we are in the sea, <laughs> the story begins to shift. So when Jesus said, you a little faith, he's not saying that you didn't have enough, he said it didn't last long enough. Oh, I gotta say it again. When he says, oh, you a little faith, he's not saying you didn't have enough, he just saw you walking on water toward him. It's like Elijah calling down the fire and consuming this offering and then the next day after Jezebel makes her threat, he's running for his life. Did you just forget the lesson of Carmel? How many times do we forget what he already did? We have heard enough testimonies. We have seen enough power of God to never have a faith problem again. You know why? Because it only requires a little bit. Because faith is a seed. And inside that seed is the biggest tree. Come on, y'all. We can do this. We can do this. Stir your faith. I know it's hard. I know that ship is moving. And I know you feel like you're going to lose your mind. But you got to stir your faith. Jesus is trying to look and see. Now, he's going to come rescue you either way. But he is trying to look and see. Will they learn? Show him. Jesus, we got it. We got this. I'm trusting you because I've already seen you. I've seen you work. And the songs that I sing on Sunday morning aren't just lyrics. Let it not just be a song with a melody. I want to offer something pleasing. I want you to know that this faith is real. And so I challenge you all. Oh, man. This is faith on a higher level. <laughs> I'm going to say this is going to sound kind of bad. And I don't want you to go too far with this statement because technically it's not true. But it's almost like we have to have faith in our faith. Now, we don't want to do that, really. We want to have faith in God. But the point I'm making is be at rest. You have enough faith. You ha it's enough. <laughs> Look at somebody real quick and say it's enough. It's enough. We got to learn to just rest in the fact it's enough. I ain't got to go try to find it somewhere else. Look under the couch. Is there anything else? <laughs> Any more faith under the cushion? No. You have enough. Two fish and five loaves is enough. All right. Now, <laughs> the test of this, the trying of this faith is a time issue. Will your faith endure over time? Because life's challenges will come to teach us that endurance. So we have to decide to stir our faith. Well, how do I, how do I rekindle a faith that's going out? Faith comes by hearing. Mm 